you know, we're always looking out for those moments, those shifts that signal something bigger. Mm -hmm. And we saw a pretty significant one recently in military aviation. Yeah. The F-15C Eagle, legendary plane. It just completed its final active duty flight out of Kadena Air Base in Japan. Wow. After what? Four decades? Over four decades of service there, yeah. That's a long run. And it's not just, you know, swapping out an old jet. Kadena's location makes this really interesting. Exactly. So important strategically right there in the Indo-Pacific. Crucial. And that's what we're going to dig into today. We've got some good sources lined up. Air and Space Forces Magazine, Army Recognition, plus the, uh, the big Wikipedia entry on the F-15 Eagle itself. Solid reads, all of them. Yeah. So our mission for you listening is to pull out the key stuff here. Why this retirement now? What's the F-15C's legacy really about? And uh, maybe most importantly, what's next for air superiority at Kadena? Okay, sounds like a plan. Where should we start? The end of the era itself? Let's do it. The specifics of the phase out at Kadena. So the absolute final active duty F-15C flight from Kadena was January 24th, 2025. Right, that was the marker. But this wasn't like an overnight thing. No, not at all. Our sources say Kadena started phasing out the F-15C and D models way back in 2022. That's right. And the main reason, according to you know Air Force leadership, yeah. was basically that these planes were getting old. They'd flown way past their intended service life. They exceeded their limits. I mean, 40 plus years for a fighter jet. That's incredible longevity. It really is. Speaks volumes about the original design and frankly, the maintenance crews keeping them flying. Definitely. And it wasn't a quiet exit either, yeah. was it? There were milestones, a farewell ceremony back in April 2023. Yeah. Sounds like they gave it a proper send-off. They did. A recognition of its service, for sure. And then, even though the last sea model flew in January, uh -huh. the 18th wing didn't officially confirm the entire sea fleet was gone or grounded until a release on March 26, 2025. Okay, so a bit of a delay in the official word. Yeah, and interestingly, that announcement specifically called out the F-15Cs. Didn't mention the two-seater F-15Ds. Hmm. So maybe a question mark still hanging over the Ds. Or maybe they were just grouped in implicitly. Could be. And there was other stuff happening right around that last flight time, too, organizationally? Right, I saw that. The 67th Fighter Generation Squadron stood up. Activated, yeah. And the 18th Aircraft Maintenance Squadron was deactivated same day in January. What's the deal with that? Well, that's part of this bigger Air Force shift towards what they call the Fighter Generation Squadron model. Okay. It's not just shuffling boxes on an org chart. The idea is to get the operators, the pilots, and the maintainers working much, much closer together, like embedded in the same squadron unit. Uh, breaking down silos. Exactly. Aiming for, you know, more efficiency, faster turnaround, keeping those planes ready to go, more agile. Makes sense. Pilots and maintainers, same team, same goals. Okay, so let's dig a bit more into the why now. You mentioned service life, but what else pushed this retirement? Oh, absolutely other factors. The maintenance burden was just growing and growing. Right. Older planes, more problems. Yeah, more time, more money, more resources needed just to keep them safe and effective. And related to that, definite concerns about airworthiness were popping up. Can't compromise on safety. No way. So Air Force leaders basically had to make a call, keep pouring money into these aging eagles, or... Or invest in the future. Precisely. It became a strategic resource allocation thing. Does it make sense to keep patching up the old birds, or is it time to put that effort into newer platforms? And the decision was clearly for the newer platforms. Yep. And this fits into the much, much broader push to modernize U.S. air power overall. Right. Transitioning away from some legacy systems. Moving towards more modern fourth-gen fighters, like the F-15E Strike Eagle, which is different. More multi-role. Yeah. And especially towards fifth-generation jets. The F-22s, the f 35 The stealthy ones with all the integrated sensors and data fusion. Exactly. Those capabilities are seen as much better suited for the kind of threats you might face today, especially in a complex place like the Indo-Pacific. Things the F-15C, even with upgrades, just wasn't designed for. Stealth, mm -hmm. that kind of network integration. Right. It's a different ball game now compared to when the F-15C came online. So continuing to invest heavily in the CD models just wasn't seen as the best strategic move anymore. Okay, that paints a pretty clear picture of the why. 
But, I mean, to really get why this is a moment, we have to talk about the F-15C itself. This wasn't just any plane being retired. Oh, not at all. It's iconic. It really defined air superiority for decades. Yeah. Its legacy is huge. Absolutely. So the F-15 Eagle, originally designed by McDonnell Douglas, this was back in the day, a direct response to the Soviet MiG-25 Foxbat. Right. The fact that caused quite a stir in the West, didn't it? High speed, high altitude. Big time. So the F-15 was conceived from the get-go as a pure air superiority fighter. No compromises on that mission. The F-15C was an evolution of the initial A and B models, and it hit service in 1979. And its job was simple. Own the sky. That was it. Pure air dominance. And it had the tools. Powerful twin engines, Pratt and Whitney's, giving it massive thrust. Huge engines. Yeah. Now, it wasn't stealthy, big radar cross-section, but its strengths were elsewhere. Like raw performance. Exactly. Incredible thrust to weight ratio, mm -hmm. big wings, low wing loading. Think like a sports car built for cornering. Okay, agile. Incredibly agile, could pull 9G turns without losing much speed, climb like a rocket, top speed, Mach 2.5 up high, service ceiling over 60,000 feet, wow. combat radius around the thousand kilometers, maybe 600 miles or so. And you could stretch that with conformal fuel tanks or aerial refueling. So it had the legs, the speed, the altitude, the agility. It could basically outperform anything it might meet. That was the idea and largely the reality for a long, long time. Armament wise, you had the internal 20 millimeter Gatling gun right, yeah. and missiles typically aim nine sidewinders for close in fights and aim 120 aim rams for longer ranges. Standard loadout. Were there major upgrades over its life? Oh yeah. A big one was fitting many F-15Cs with the APG-63 V3 ESA radar. ESA, Active Electronically Scanned Array. That's a big deal, right? Huge deal. Game changer. Lets you track multiple targets. Much harder to jam compared to the old mechanically scanned radars. And many got the JHMCS, the helmet-mounted queuing system. Look where you want to shoot. Pretty much. Aim with your eyes. So they definitely kept updating it. And the combat record. I mean, the stories are legendary. They really are. The F-15, primarily the C model in air-to-air, -air, is credited with over 100 confirmed air-to-air -air kills. Over 100. And here's the kicker. Zero reported losses in air-to-air -air combat for the F-15 itself. Wait, zero losses yeah. in actual dogfights? Zero confirmed losses in air-to-air -air engagements. Most of those kills were during Desert Storm against the Iraqi Air Force, but it also saw action over the Balkans, Persian Gulf. That undefeated record is just remarkable. Undefeated? That's incredible. Really underlines its dominance. So was it strictly an air-to-air -air machine then? No ground attack capability at all? Well, its primary design focus was absolutely air superiority. But the original F-15 design did actually include a secondary kind of basic ground attack capability. Oh, really? The USAF used that? The U.S. Air Force didn't really focus on it for the CD models. But interestingly, Israel did. They heavily developed and used that capability on their F-15 ABCD variants, nicknamed Baz. Used them for strike missions, even. Uh -huh. So there was some built-in versatility there, even if not everyone tapped into it. Historically speaking, where does it fit? You mentioned replacing the Phantom. Right. The Air Force actually called it the first dedicated USAF air superiority fighter since the F-86 Sabre from the Korean War. Wow. Drawing a line back to the Sabre. Yeah. And its development was massively influenced by lessons from Vietnam. That war really hammered home the need for maneuverability, for dogfighting capability. Which the F-4 wasn't perfectly optimized for initially. Exactly. And there was this internal push too, the fighter mafia arguing for light, agile fighters. Then, like we said, the MiG-25 shows up and kind of forces the issue. We need something better. So the F-15 was the answer. Replace the F-4 as the top dog for air superiority during the late Cold War. Yep. And its success was so clear, it actually led directly to developing the F-15E Strike Eagle. Take that amazing airframe and make it a dual-role powerhouse for air-to-ground, too. The mud hen, right. There was even a weird side story in the 80s using an F-15 to test launch an anti-satellite missile, the ASM-135. Anti-satellite from an F-15. That's why. Yeah, a couple of tests didn't become operational, but it shows they were exploring different things with the platform. Fascinating detour. Okay, so legendary plane, long service, undefeated record. Now it's gone from Kadena. How is the Air Force plugging that gap, yeah. especially in such a hot spot? That's the key question, right? Maintaining presence. What they've been doing since the phase-out began is rotating other fighter squadrons through Kadena. What kinds? A mix, really. Fourth-gen, like F-15Es, F-16s, and fifth-gen F-35s, and even F-22 Raptors have done rotations there. So keeping capability there, but with different planes coming and going, is that the permanent fix? It seems to be the interim solution. 
The longer term plan, according to the 18th Wing Commander Brig General Nicholas Evans, mm -hmm. is the arrival of the brand new F 15 EX Eagle II. The EX, successor to the CD. Exactly. He expects the first ones to touch down at Kadena sometime between March and June 2026. So, a couple of years out, roughly. Yeah. And the plan is to replace the 48 retiring F 15 C and D models with 36 of these new F 15 EXs. Fewer planes, but presumably much more capable ones. That's the idea. The F 15 EX keeps the same basic, proven aerodynamic shape of the Eagle. If it ain't broke. Right. But underneath, it's packed with modern tech fly by wire controls, a really advanced AESA radar, the APG 82 V1 a new electronic warfare suite called EPOD WSS for self-protection, right. and a significantly beefed up payload. It can carry, reportedly, up to 22 air-to-air -air missiles. 22? That's a lot of missiles. That's a serious amount of firepower hanging off the wings. So, yeah. yeah, builds on the Eagle's strengths, but brings it firmly into the 21st century, plus a lot more punch. And presumably, being based on the F-15, it's maybe easier to produce or integrate than starting something totally new. That's a big part of the strategy. It uses the existing advanced Eagle production line that was building F-15s for international customers. Ah, so the factory is already running. Exactly. Yeah. Minimizes lead times, keeps costs down compared to, say, trying to restart F-22 production, which everyone agreed would be astronomically expensive. Makes sense. Are the Kadena folks getting ready for it? They are. Some 18th wing personnel have already done training on the F-15EX over at Portland Air National Guard Base. And interestingly, the training focused on making that shift. From pure air to air. Yeah, from the F-15C's primarily air to air world to the multi-role capabilities of the EX, incorporating air to ground tactics right from the start. So the EX is truly designed as multi-role from day one. I thought the Air Force wanted a whole bunch of these initially, like over 140. The initial plan was around 144, yeah. That number seems to have come down a bit, maybe closer to 122 now, depending on budgets and final decisions. Still a decent fleet size. Definitely. And U.S. officials are stressing that between these rotational deployments of advanced jets now and the F-15EX coming later, yeah, the operational capability at Kadena will be maintained or even enhanced, no drop-off in deterrence or ability. And Kadena itself, I mean, its importance hasn't changed one bit, right? Not at all. If anything, its strategic value is only increasing, less than 800 kilometers from Taiwan, like you said. It's absolutely vital for projecting power, for working with Japan on joint deterrence, and frankly, for balancing against China's regional influence. So retiring the old eagles doesn't change Kadena's fundamental role? No way. It remains a critical cornerstone for the U.S. and the Indo-Pacific. Okay, so we've covered the end, the transition, the future plan. Let's maybe zoom out again. Back to the F-15's origins, you mentioned Vietnam shaping it. Can we explore that a bit more, the context that birthed the Eagle? Sure. Yeah, the whole Genesis story is fascinating. It really goes back to debates inside the Pentagon in the 60s about what kind of tactical aircraft were needed. Before the F-15 was even conceived. Right. You had Defense Secretary McNamara pushing hard for commonality between the services. One plane designed for both the Air Force and Navy, mainly to save money. The F-111 TFX program came out of that thinking, didn't it? It did. Envisioned as a multi-role, do-it-all plane. But, you know, the reality of combat, especially in Vietnam, yeah. it showed that maybe trying to be a jack-of-all-trades meant you weren't master of the crucial one, which was air-to-air -air combat dogfighting. Maneuverability was king. So the F-111 wasn't the dogfighter they needed. Not really. A great bomber, complex plane, but not an agile fighter. So Vietnam lessons really highlighted this need for a dedicated air superiority fighter. That led to the FX program Fighter Experimental. The program that led to the F-15. Exactly. And you had that fighter mafia group pushing internally for something lightweight, highly maneuverable, kind of back to basics for air combat. And then the MiG-25 appears. And then the MiG-25 appears, and suddenly the need for a truly dominant air superiority fighter becomes undeniable. All those factors kind of converged. Combat lessons, internal debates, a new perceived threat. Boom, the F-15 requirement was born. And it stepped into that role, replacing the F-4? Yep. Became the premier USAF air superiority fighter for the late Cold War and beyond. And like we said, its success directly led to the F-15E Strike Eagle later on. Got it. So dominant aircraft, long service life. 
But it wasn't always perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't there a grounding issue at one point? Structural problems. Ah, uh, yes. That was a serious one. Back in 2007, a Missouri Air National Guard F-15C actually broke apart in midair. Broke apart. Wow. Yeah. Catastrophic structural failure. Thankfully, the pilot ejected safely, but it led to grounding the entire F-15 Fleet A through D models temporarily. What caused it? Investigations found cracks and problems with a critical structural part called a longeron, basically part of the fuselage frame. It highlighted the real challenges of keeping these high-performance airframes going as they get older and rack up flight hours, metal fatigue, stress. It catches up eventually. A stark reminder of the stresses these machines endure. Definitely. And that incident likely played a role in accelerating the retirement of the older F-15A and B models, which the USAF retired completely back in 2009. That left the C and D models carrying the air superiority torch until... Well, now at Kaduna. And now many of those retired birds are ending up in museums, right? Yeah, a lot of them. Preserved as pieces of aviation history, which they certainly are. You can see them at air museums all over the world now. A fitting end for such an iconic aircraft. Okay, okay so let's try and wrap this up for everyone listening. This retirement of the F-15C from Kadena, it's clearly more than just swapping out jets. It really is a marker. Yeah, a major transition. Yeah. It's driven by you know, the, the simple fact that these planes are old. They've served incredibly well, but it's time and also by that strategic need to modernize, especially in a place as vital as the Indo-Pacific. Can't stand still. Right. The F-15C's record, over 100 kills, no losses in air combat. Mm. It's legendary, played a massive role for decades. But seeing it replaced by these rotations of newer jets, F-35s, F-22s, and eventually the F-15EX Eagle II, it shows the Air Force adapting adapting to new threats, new technologies, the demands of that region. It's that constant cycle in military aviation, honoring the past, but focusing squarely on future challenges. Exactly. Which kind of leads to a final thought, something for you, our listener, to chew on. Okay. With this new mix at Kadena, the incoming F-15EX, with its huge missile load and modern systems, alongside these rotating fifth-gen fighters like F-22s and F-35s, how does that actually shift the balance of air power in the Indo-Pacific? Mm, good question. What are the sort of... Uh, longer-term ripple effects for regional security, for the U.S. ability to project power there. It's this ongoing story, isn't it? The evolution of air combat, the mix of proven legacy designs, and cutting-edge tech. Yeah, it definitely makes you think about what the next chapter looks like in that critical part of the world. It's not just about the planes, but how they fit into the bigger strategic picture. For sure. Fascinating transition to watch. <laughs>